So this is the process for how to make heavy mache pulp that I use. So I've got very hot water in there. Normally I would put it in a bucket and pour boiling water over the top. And I would do about 18. But it very quickly goes soft. Right now it's too hot, so if I was doing it with children I would soak it the night before, so it's really soaked. Drain the water out, take it to work, add a bit more water, and set them to work ripping. It's a really interesting thing, how to rip. So, for example, the thing is, we don't think about it. We know how to rip, but if you don't know how to rip, if you don't know how to rip, it's not obvious. You're sort of, ugh. Mind you, with this stuff, you can't really go wrong. But it's just a very interesting thing to notice what you do. You grab it on the edge. You don't realize until you actually do it and slow it down. So here, I'll slow it down, get rid of that bit, and you see what I do. I mean, you know what you do. But, and you could just watch. And there are many people who say, don't show the children anything. Because you deprive them of the opportunity of discovering it themselves. And I think that's quite a valid point. But it's only true if children are exposed to people ripping, or whatever the case may be, making lace, fixing bicycles, chopping wood, making pizza. If they're exposed to it, fine, you'll soon pick it up by watching and actually even seeing it once. But it, it, the impulse to sort of grab and just throw the whole lot back in. So I've made stories. I did make a story about two flamingos who grabbed the paper with one hand and one with the other hand. So it's not so much teaching, it's giving a story. And they, one went this way and one went that way. And they pulled and the whole thing ripped. They weren't trying to rip it in the story there. It was a bit of an accident. So anyway, once you get good at it, of course, you can use your whole hand and rip. And it's a very meditative and pleasant task. And I've had some nice times with children learning how to do it. So once you've made it into nice little bits, you put it into little bits because otherwise you'll ruin your kitchen whiz. But eventually you've just got lots of little shreddy, pulpy things. And at this point I should also point out that um, I should have been doing it more from the side, but never mind. Um, but grey, uncoloured, undyed, unprocessed, whatever this stuff is, recycled paper, is better than pink or yellow. Pink or yellow just doesn't quite behave. There's another component that's been added that gets in the way. So, I will pause the video, skillfully by pressing the right button. And once you've ripped them all, you've got a sort of a, a very liquid container full of bits of shreds, you could go on playing with it and go on ripping because it's soft and it's interesting and if you've got warm water in it, it's, um, it's a very pleasant, messy play. Not that messy, it's only paper and water really. Um, activity. And you're going to make something with it which makes it an even more interesting activity. Then I usually get, you know, need to find a container that everybody can get their hands into, a nice wide shallow bowl so everybody can get at it, otherwise it can be a bit of a nightmare. And then when you've got it like that, I would put it into one of those 10 litre, is it? No, yes, 10 litre plastic paint buckets because it's nice and deep. But I won't do that because you won't be able to see. And now comes an unholy noise. God knows what it'll sound like. Main thing is to keep it under the water, or it goes everywhere. You'll be familiar with one of these. This is a brawn, you know, it's what you, what they call it? A kitchen whiz. Make sure it's under the water, make sure it's plugged in. <laughs> Press the button. It helps you, you lift and drop. to be deeper. I'll make the water deeper. Then I can get under without 
suddenly splattering my phone with bits of pulp. There we go. The more water you've got, you know, it's like when you're doing potatoes. You think you've got lots of water and it turns out once they've pulped that you don't anymore and that's when you burn it out. But if you don't get the water ratio wrong, you don't burn it out at all. It's perfectly capable of doing this. Just don't do massive loads at once. <laughs> well, that got you. Well, that was a good demonstration, wasn't it, of what happens if you don't do it in a deep bucket. I think everybody's all right. Not very much on the camera at all, really. Just a little bit here and there. <laughs> there we go. This stage is also a lot of fun with children. I've often used those um, sieves that you get in a sandpit. But basically, you need to strain out the water, get yourself a lump, keep mushing the water out so you can actually pick it up. There we go, now I can pick it up. It's a lump. I can squeeze it, get the water out. Best to really, and when they've done it, do it again yourself because they um, tend to want to get onto the next bit. So then you just put it in a container and keep going. So I think in this case I've got so much water that I have to use a sieve. But as you can see, it doesn't take very long to get the water out. And then you've got a lump, and that's quite an interesting texture as well. Until you've got a whole lot of well squeezed because it's easy enough to add more water but once the glue's in pretty much impossible to get the water out because it just goes squidge right actually the sieve idea is quite a slow one but much more hands-on and interesting for the children depends what your time frame is but normally i would tie a big sack or a pillowcase quite good over the top of a 10 liter paint bucket or any bucket a big one pour the slippy sloppy slip slop into there pick up the corners tie them together and hang it in a sack like you would when you're making free joe jelly or any sort of jelly and let the water drain out there's also the possibility of course of squeezing the sack which you're not supposed to do with free joe jelly because it makes it cloudy but it's a bloody good idea when you're making papillary pulp right so when you squeeze all the water out break up the lumpy bits that you've you know you've squeezed it so it's a bit sort of prone to being all lumped up um Break them up a bit, like you're making crumble for crumble. And then, um, I probably, I've never worked this out, but I would say that one level rounded, one rounded dessert spoon would be absolutely heaps for what was actually only one egg tray. So I'll put it on, on, so you sprinkle it on. Don't let the children touch it at this point because it sticks to their hands in great lumps and you'll never get it off again. And waste all that glue. So basically, toss it a little bit without digging your hands in too far. And once it's got a bit wet, you can start to... I must put my hands the other way, sorry, so you can see. And then you can start squidging it. And you might decide that it's actually too dry. It's probably yeah, just a tad dry. Depends what you're making. The drier it is, of course, the quicker it'll dry when you finish. And in many ways, this is a summer sport because you put it out on a hot sunny afternoon and it's dry in minutes. But if you're only making small quantities, the oven's great or a hot water cupboard or something like that once you've made the things, you don't want to dry it yet. So now you've got this lovely pulpy mess. I'm going to put one tiny little drop of water in. That'll do. Just like that. It's hard to tell because I've only got one here. Put a photograph in. So now, now you've got this lump. Um, you know you could make it into a ball if you want to do, but you don't want to do that because if you throw that when it's dry, it'll. It's like throwing a piece of four by two at somebody because basically this is what it is. This is wood. This is paper pulp from wood. And um, that's why I don't make them balls. In fact. I'm a little cavalier about it. If they just make a pancake or a ball, I tend to just say that's lovely and put it back in when they're not looking or something, depending. And I just give them ideas about I shouldn't say that, I suppose, but I do. I do. I do. I challenge them. What about an island? Could you make a volcano? Could you make um, a lake? Could you make a bowl? What about um, who could make? Oh, look what you've made. You've made a dinosaur. Oh, look at that. It's a bridge. Well done. 
And so you just, you know, it's just like with the play though, you throw in a few ideas at provocations, I believe they're called in the professional world, and, um, and then riff on whatever they've made. Just develop whatever they produce, and they always will. And a nest full of eggs. <laughs> it's, a, it's great. So now it comes to the point of you've got sticky, gluey hands. And I'll just teach you this bit as well because um, it's really useful to know. Um, pause. I always have a large dry bath towel on hand so they can rub almost all the slimy gluey stuff off their hands before they think about washing them. Because as soon as you add water, of course, you're going to make your hands really slimy because they've already got glue on them. So if you don't do that thing before, you'll be washing your hands until kingdom come to get the slime off. So I always get them to do the towel first, really hard, and then wash hard and dry hard. And we're very good at washing hands now, so no worries there. Different hand for drying. Different towel for drying, I think, would have been good. That was just very slimy. Okay. Okay, so one thing I can tell you is that that was too much glue. Um, when it's too slimy, children really can't, there's not enough friction. But, so this is a bit, I wouldn't do it as glue because they'll find it easier. I, I have had enough experience to not be deterred by its um, sliminess. And a lot of children are deterred by sliminess. They've been brought up to... So now you can see I am making a person. And really, that's all you need. Which is, um, it was interesting last night that I talked about um, manual dexterity, can't even say it, um, but I didn't mention the other thing that I feel very strongly about, which is oral literacy. And this little person who stands um, reminds me of one of my beef theories. Is that a pet theory, not a beef theory? Um, that, that, that children do also like things that stand, you know, if you've got, a, you know, what's he called, G.I. Joe standing and he's a hero, if he keeps falling over, you're not going to stick with him. You need a man that can stand up, you know, you need a princess who can stay on her feet and dance all night. Um, this is a boat. And at this point, you know, you might include small, a bit like you do with clay. You don't have any worries with clay, but for some reason with Play-Doh, you think they should have cutouts. I don't know why. But I think this sort of thing is much more skilled, so that I can shape my edge of my boat in, so that it's a, you know, not so much a flat squash thing. And, and you know, they'll get better at it the more they do it, and it's just a question of, you know, making it available like we do with Play-Doh. So I might want quite a big person to sit in there, so I might make more of a coracle than a, oops, it's got a hole in the bottom, no worries, fix that in a jiffy. And the reason I do it on cardboard is so that I can dry them, and I won't forget whose is whose, because I can write on it. It might stick to the cardboard, well, it might not. So there we go, there's a boat, and that was a person. And now, finally, what should it be? If you were here, I would ask you. Um, a person. Well, I'll do another person, because really, basically, if you squeeze it in your hands, and then you let your finger and your thumb, your forefinger and your thumb do some action, well, actually, the main thing is to get a good solid base. Did I get round to my point? Yes. Children like to have characters who stand up. Because then you don't have to keep propping them up against trees and things. You just ditch them. And that is why they love... Well, it's not why. It's one of the reasons why they naturally gravitate towards dinosaurs and trucks. But the trouble with dinosaurs and trucks, and this is my pet theory part coming in any minute now, is that... um. They don't talk, they grunt. They grunt, they growl, they roar, they growl, but they do not talk. And if we want children to talk, and I do want children to talk, because if you can't communicate, you know, by the age of five, things are not looking good. Because then when you need to say something like, I really don't like what you're doing, and if you keep doing it, I'm probably gonna take your head out. Um, if you can't say that, then you'll probably just use your fist, which is fair enough, very reasonable. So that's one of the reasons why it's important to have words. They're just damned handy, and they often can't. So I like to have lots of people, because people can talk. So this one might be, you know, um, they tend to acquire a character very rapidly. But little people like this, hundreds of them. I'll show you a picture of some others. Um, that's enough of that. I'll turn it off. 
was I saying? I was in the middle of a sentence for heaven's sakes. People like this invite relationship, invite dialogue, invite finantana. This is, you know, so here we have, and it might be, I'm not sure who this is, but this one has clearly got open arms. You can make the arms, they get very strong um, once they're dry. And I'll demonstrate the other sequence as well, the rest of the sequence, because obviously this is not a finished item. It is a bit of a, a bit of a monster, really. Hello, Mum. Hello, darling. Mwah!